Good afternoon, everybody. So I spent uh, the majority of my professional life between artificial intelligence and education as entrepreneur, investor, or uh, executive, as I'm now, but then also as teacher, professor, um, as data science or governance of artificial intelligence. And through that, I got convinced that there is one area where artificial intelligence will make a massive difference going forward. That's going to be education. Now, until recently, I must admit that that was based on expectations, assumptions, and so on. The proof of that was fairly limited. But then things changed in the last three to four years when uh, new models could actually start understanding content so we can change the way we learn. So I want to share what we learned in that period of time, going from the first large language models to deploying these large language models into education. So EdTech for me is platforms, online platforms where students learn. And it can be from Q&A, so where you get people get answers to their questions, or it can be entire courses. So it's a very broad uh, field. Now, the interest in education, in ed tech in general, stems for the size. It's a massive economic sector, about 6% of GDP it's, um, in education. It's a growing area, 800 million new learners between 2020 and 2030. There's a social demand, a large growing social demand. But there's also a systematic mismatch. Mismatch between the skills that we prepare people for and the skills that the economy and industry needs. Some people have tried to figure out, estimate what is the economic impact of this mismatch, the, that mismatch. And they come to numbers like $8 trillion of revenue lost in 2030 because of lack of technical skills. So there's this large societal need to change education, and there's a large economic opportunity and need to change education. When I mean change in education, changing from the linear one-side-fits-all that we've seen for the last two centuries, to education where everyone has a chance of having the best possible tutor, which is just for that learner itself or herself. We believe in businesses that have a large societal need, a large economic opportunity. And as producers, we invested in many uh, sectors, not only education, classifieds, people buy and sell things online, fintech, payments, food delivery. If you buy food in Germany, chances are you touch some of our brands, and of course, education technology. So um, in the last few years, we invested more or less $3 billion in companies that support education online, and over 500 million learners touched our platforms across the globe. So we believe we have a pretty good view of what online education means and where it can go. Now, since all our platforms are consumer platforms, which massive number of interactions, as you can imagine, imagine we have used artificial intelligence machine learning for a very long time. So it's not something which is nice to have. It makes it possible for this platform to operate at scale. Right? Education technology is one of the places where machine learning has been used, but has been used predominantly to improve the experience of learners. Choose the course, choose what you're going to learn next, and so on. But not much to change the way you learn. So that's the reality of the last 15 years. A few years back, I think in 2019, we started investing seriously in large language models. So to give you a sense, 2019 is GPT-2 or pre-GPT-2. Pre so we're using very early stage models. We were training our own models and so on. And what we really wanted to figure out, is this something which is important and is it going to be something which is a known, um, uh, is, is it something which is major, is just a, a, a small improvement to technology that we have, and how do we get to the point of understanding that difference? So we started testing across the group, and we started testing also in at tech. And you can do it in many different ways. One of the ways that we did it, we looked at Q&A. Q&A is one of the simplest form of online education. Students ask for a question in many, many uh, domains, and teachers answer, so you make that available. And then in 2019, we tested whether models, that was our naive idea at that time, right, could actually replace teachers. right? Because if that's the case, you can see how things are going the, in the next few years, and that can have a big impact. 2019 and these tests didn't give very good results. They didn't really work well. Right? It's just the way it was there. But they improved all the time continuously. To the point that beginning of last year, let's say end 21, early 22, we were impressed. 
So some of these models that we had available at that time could answer some of the hardest questions that, teach, that students have better than teachers. And so that was the situation there. Now, that was excitement, and we were also concerned. Excitement if this works, and this is just the first inning of the game, this is going to be massive in just a few years, but also concern, because this is going to undermine an entire sector in ways that we don't know. So how do we test this, right? So we figure out that there's only one way to do it, is test things out. So we went and we done a number of trials with educators and with students, of course, before you can deploy these kind of things. We wanted to find out what do we need to get Gen AI work in education, in practice. What's interesting is that the test with educators and students were not that good. The synthetic things went great. Tests with students and educators were not good. And the reason is that on paper, you ask a question, you get the good answer, you can benchmark it. But in terms of education, that's not what you need. And the reasons why it didn't work are two. Because the system needs to know you. It needs to know what you know, what you don't know. What are the things that we're actually good at? What are the things that you're not good at? You don't need a general answer. You need an answer for you. The other thing is that the way you teach the same thing in India, in Brazil, in Canada is not the same. Textbooks are different. The path is different. The examples you use is different. The concepts, the sequence of concepts are different. So this, the tools were good at giving you a general average answer, which is better than anybody else, but they were not good at giving you the answer that you wanted, right? And that's problematic. So we call that the problem of photosynthesis. This is one of the two problems that we really spent a lot of time. I mean, photosynthesis per se is not a problem, right? But if you ask a question, a model gives you an answer. A model, any of the models that we have now out there, they have absorbed everything that humanity has written about photosynthesis. There's no problem to get an answer which is correct, precise, and probably better than any average teacher. It's just the normality for these things, right? But you don't have the answer that, needs, that I need at that point in time in that journey. So how do we de did we try to solve that problem? Well, we went back to the root. We took the models and retrained them. The same models retrained on education material that we knew. We actually inserted these models through training, learning paths. And then since we work with students, we know where students go, we could use that information in terms of prompting, meta-prompting, and all the other tools that we have to make this model work. So in fact, we stopped thinking about these models as sources of knowledge. If you think about GPT-4, Claude, and so on, it's not only a storage of knowledge. It is an embryonic reasoning engine. So if you actually take these two, you can build technology on top that can make the experience of education personalized and effective. So we did it, and we tested again, and then the results were good. So the feedback for students was positive, but also the adoption of the platforms went up. So I think we sort of came to the conclusion, yes, it can be done, but it's not as trivial as we thought. The initial idea that you take a model and it works, it doesn't work in practice. But ex post is obvious. We try to go away from the idea that one size fits all in human terms. Why should one size fits all in machine terms work, right? There's no sense for that to be. First thing. Then there's another problem we needed to solve or need to address. How do we trust these things? We know that these models tend to give you a very confident and sometimes wrong answer, but still very confident. Now, let's step in a different uh, area. Uh, in uh, more or less summer last year, we released across our entire group, so all employees, it's not education in this case, all employees, a tool which is um, um, a digital assistant, it's an AI assistant, where everybody can test generative AI in their work, everybody that wants, right? It's available to everybody. So some companies banned ChatGPT. We said, well, if we give it the right protection, privacy, and security, we should actually make sure that as many people as possible use them, because that's the only way we can learn what works and what doesn't. So we created this tool as a sort of collective discovery tool. So it's used by 10,000 people, more or less, at this moment. And we learned tons of things there. But one of the things that we learned, how do you control hallucinations? What is it that makes this work, these tools work? And then you need to do that 
in this case by testing with our employees, before you can go out with learners. So this is what happens. Back in October 2022, when we had already thousands of users, the number of hallucinations was very high. By the way, every time a user interacts with this Gen AI assistant plus one.io, it's like having an extra team member, right? Everybody deserves an, an assistant afterwards, right? They can say, thumbs up, great, thumbs down, it doesn't work. Hard, I really love what they're telling me. But then there's Pinocchio. Pinocchio means, you know what, it's pretty bad, but sometimes even worse, you made the things up. You lied to me, right? So when people click on Pinocchio, it means they're really unsatisfied. And these are the things that we need to control because they eliminate trust, right? So if you control that, you can create trust. If you keep them, you don't. So in October 22, we had close to 10% of Pinocchios, right? So it means that, you know, this is a minefield. It means that you really have to supervise everything that these models do. Then you fast forward in June, it's 2.9%. So what happened in between? A few things. First, the models, the underlying models, got better, as simple as that. Right? The models underlying that we use, there are several models we use underlying this, they got better. Second, we got a lot better at cornering these models to do what we want. Right? So that means prompting, meta prompting, dynamic prompting, having other models that look at the question and the answer and estimated the probability that this is going to lead to hallucination, which in that case, you prevent the model to answer, right? It means that sometimes it's not responsive, but you don't create a wrong answer that is going to mislead everybody. So through that process, we managed to get down to 29% in June, and it's still going down. What we believe that with a combination of improvements and controls, you probably won't eliminate the chance that these models hallucinate, but you can eliminate the chance that there's an effect on the use of the models. So you do not prevent the error of the source, you prevent the effects of that error. So we are totally convinced that that's the case. Now, if you go back then at my original uh, belief that say that if there's one area where artificial intelligence is going to make a difference, one of these areas is going to be education, I think we are at a point in which we have understood how to make this work, right? It is not trivial. It is not just take a model, put it out there, and it's going to replace a teacher, right? You have to understand the essence of these models and build a lot of technology around them to make them work properly. If when that happens, then the results come. And then you can have a process, a path of learning, which is individual for every single student. And that's really important. Because imagine this, it means that, in fact, you can have a tutor, and in this case, a great tutor for every single learner. And that's accessible to everybody, not only those that can afford it, but to everybody. I think that's a material change in education, right? If you can also control uh, this in the sense of the bad possible answer you can get, then you have all the ingredients to make this work. So we came through a very short path in all this developed in the last three years. And then you can imagine this is like the five, first five minutes of the game. Right? So if you can see what is going to possibly happen to education in the next five years, it's going to be great, it's going to be positive. We're really looking forward to that. Thank you very much.